We're on the books now. Yeah, we're on we're on record. Whoa. So for those of you who are going to listen to this recording after we were recording, you just missed a ton of juicy insider information that we're not going to put out for public. Only members. available to board members. Only only yeah. available for people who attend this meeting and are on time. All the tea. <laughs> Um, speaking about board members, um, we wanted to invite um, Green Bandit to participate on the board. And we don't really quite know what positions we currently fill on the board. So I think it's more an open invitation to participating. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, if you want to, if you just want to make the meetings, uh, the board meeting is, yeah, you're, you're welcome to make the meetings. We are doing them on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Yep, and I can add your emails to the Google event that we have. And then look who we have. We have a board member and one of the original founders on his iPhone. Scott Langfield is joining Sorry, us. Sorry guys, I'm, I'm actually driving down Christina's driveway right now because I got to go help somebody butcher a pig, but I'm listening. <laughs> okay. Right on. Are so, they butchering Charlotte right now? I don't know. Brett said your house or Donnie's <laughs> house. So here I am. They're going to butcher Charlotte and I'm not even there. Okay. Crazy. Uh, Brian's yeah. mom's name is Charlotte. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> well, Charlotte's Charlotte. our backup pig. Awkward. <laughs> Actually, I think, it, I think it's Brock's backup pig, Christine. The, uh, the... Oh, it's Brock's at my house? Yeah, apparently so. I'm kind of confused while we're here, but here we go. Well, have fun. I'm not there. I'm at the farm. Just could you could you mute your phone while you're doing it though, if you don't mind? Oh yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to know where my food comes from. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. But I don't want to know that much. Like <laughs> you had to see me killing all the fish last time. We're like just a that's right. Yeah, you guys meetings had a, now. a super successful run on the coast there. How many fish did you guys end up getting? Well, we can only keep five rockfish a piece, but we probably caught 50 a piece. And we just kept like the really big. Oh, yeah. halibut, which you can keep 25 of those. And then mm -hmm. uh, one lean cod, which. Bass, one lean cod, and two halibut home. Okay. Nice. Sounds good. Yeah, it was fun. He's out. Devin's out there fishing right now. Right on. I have to work. But <laughs> we got Robert uh, coming on. Robert Haran, I think, is his last name. I have a general question for you guys um, regarding the uh, link. Excuse me, not LinkedIn, but the leaf, the leaf link. Um, site we we're getting ready to post or put some stuff up on there and i wanted to ask you guys about um <clears throat> pricing is there is there a do we have a threshold established i mean i to be i couldn't hear you. aaron you're muted it's 500 bucks a pound right now our a bus minimum or just everyone should have it at that price yeah I mean, that's basically the good, the best bud you can bring to market. We're, you know, because is 500 bucks a pound. That's kind of what we're all doing. We thought that that's a, you know, from what we can tell, the a, the good number that anyone can get. And um, as far as like, you know, you guys, I think it's kind of all pretty open as far as what kind of pricing specials you want to do if a store says something different. But what do you think, Christine? Yeah, Brandon and I were actually talking about this last week, I think. I don't know if she's on here yet, but um, we've been just keeping everything at 500. Now that we have more people on the board, we could discuss like having, like we don't have the Gangier thing going yet. We've talked about maybe grading our own uh, prices eventually. And like we each say like, okay, this is my 500, this is my 400 and like kind of placing our grading our own product ourselves and putting it on the menu. Um, but right now we're just all doing 500 for a bud and 250 for B bud, I think. Yep. Cool. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm open to any suggestions or any like if you think that you want to put it on a lower price shelf or we want to have different price points, we we can do that. I think. Yeah, I I had the thought, like I mentioned before, of maybe posting um, uh, flour on the board as like sale price. So that just would be something that might rotate every week or whatever for us. So we just kind of do a different four or five varieties. I think it was five is what I counted other people were using. Uh, um, so whatever that limit is, you know, putting them out as a sale and then and then having things at a at a slightly higher price on on our board if we end up going that route but ultimately i'm just i i don't want to be sitting on any weed by the time i get to harvesting and i'm i'm pretty motivated to price it price to sell you know i mean it it sucks this the way it is right now but um you know i just rather take a very slim margin than none at all you know so in a lot of ways i'm i'm 500 bucks a pound i'm happy to sit there but i also would i just don't expect the the pace to be there for what what i'm after you know i mean got a few hundred pounds still need to get the ready. point that i would make in is this is like a soft currently is not in the position to help you move all your product and when you want to lower your prices and move it in bulk, um, I think that might be utilizing a different type of avenue, such as a wholesaler or a big buyer. So um, us as a group and soft, we can all help each other. I have some connections. I have a guy that buys 100 pounds a week. Uh, he owns Floyd's. Uh, Floyd's cannabis is a cutthroat, super cheap, but at the same time, he saved my ass before. So um you know, and Christine has some connections and we can pool and help each other. But I think I my vote is I like the idea of LeafLink kind of maintaining a price and, may, and that way we can maintain a brand in this marketing effort of quality and where the product comes from and farm and really optimize that sales avenue for what it can provide us, which is the ticket price per pound and notoriety. But uh, exactly what, right. What do you think, Christine? Um, yeah, I, before you started talking, I was kind of like, hey, we should just have like a variety from anything from like the cheapest to the, the 500. But now that you said that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And that we could keep it short up on our LeafLink menu to kind of keep our co-op kind of short up and then try to make fun. Like I'm, I'm selling it to Portland Cannabis Market when they offer 400. I've been, I've taken it a couple of like three pounds now which is like woo but i took it which is under that but it's not undercutting our co-ops what we have going on for the co-op so yeah i think the, i think everything inside the co-op should match that makes sense but um, i think what um brian's is bringing light to uh, at least in my mind i i'm thinking of it which let's say he bring he's not bringing uh, the same quality of product that anyone would expect that who to be priced at 500, you know, let's say it's something that, you know, is maybe machine trimmed um, or the potency test is low. Like I have a purple punch that tests at 18, eight, um, you know, going for $500 a pound. Um, well, soft has other punch on the menu that tests higher. So naturally in this event, especially when punch is every, every member of soft has punch, it's natural to not get that sale at five and not even push it. I've never even included purple punch on any of the manifests because it's not there to compete. It won't. And, but it could go on the menu at say three fifty because a uh, dispensary would look, might look at that and see value. Um, but I think that's something, you know, we, we all kind of need to talk about in a case by case basis, um, essentially, and we don't have too many members, it's, you know, you're a new member, you get to talk to us about what your menu looks like, what your products are like, if you like, um, Christine or I can come over to the farm and get our actual eyes on the product and we can all talk about it again. And we can just perform our own internal concierge service where we all kind of, uh, hopefully uh, agree but compromise on where each other we all see the same product on a similar grading scale because if i can uh 
you know, bring my stuff to you guys in the Southern Oregon Family Farms, which includes you, um, Green Bandit, um, says, you know, hey, you know, this strain is is an A, you know, it deserves 500, but, you know, this one is, I don't think it deserves 500, you know, I mean, look at all this and this, and so maybe we'll have some different tiered. You know, when we have enough products, you know, we also have ounces, we have joints that you guys do. So uh, the opportunity to bring different, uh, you know, products to market, you know, as an ounce, no one's brought ounces to market under soft. So you get to determine what price you want. Um, you bring extracts to market or your, your pre-rolls, you're going to get to determine what you want to sell it for um, because you're the only one with it. I, yeah, and I mean, you you know, potency does, as we know, it, it really does factor largely into sales. And so, yeah, like some of the things that we have, we have a number of varieties that test kind of right, just kind of right at 20%, give or take a percent or one and a half percent, you know, so some things, our cheese head sometimes will hit 21, but other times it'll hit 19. And, you know, but I also have like my amnesia haze. All, very seldom will hit 20%. It's a good seller for us. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we have Amnita Haze right now that's probably seven, 17. Yeah, 17%. Seven. So some of those, when I, you know, when I look at the board, you know, you guys have a lot of stuff that's 23% and up. You know, I mean, it's, it, I only have a few varieties that will really get into that, that conversation. Yeah. My sourdough Kush will hit 22, 23, but, but I, I've like, yeah, like, three for three varieties for that consistently will go a mark above 20 percent so it's easy to tell which ones of ours like with the numbers and yeah it's all about the the look the smell the smoke that are clearly at that 500 rate and i do think it's great to have like open conversation with everybody because especially when it's all on the the sff menu versus anyone who has their own hundred dollar a month you know um separate but connected page. So like, I, I think of Amnesia Haze as a great example of like, that's our only strong sativa dominant strain, you know, for dispensaries that are still, you know, they really are looking at sativa indica stuff, but it's like, it smells amazing. It's really great. It looks great, smokes great, but it's just that THC number that comes in. I mean, yeah, we've hit 20% on that, but it's typically 17, 18. So it's like that one would be a candidate for like just having to be lower in order to move it if it's going to be on the, the SFF uh, menu. But just yeah. that's a great example of one that I think if it sounds good to everyone, it's like we would price that lower 350. I was thinking for this, you know, for the soft men menu, at least it's like most everything's at five. And then I was thinking based on THC number or whatnot, I was like 450, 500, you know, based off of what people are comfortable with. But like 350 is, you know, even more of an advantage for dispensaries to grab that at a lower number. Anyway, yeah. I think that if we can agree on price tiers, like we were talking, I think it was me and Brandy, but we were talking about this recently is like, it probably would be more attractive to have different prices on the menu and we should we should say like okay we're gonna have a 350 a 400 a 450 500 whatever we're gonna decide and then i i like the idea of everybody grading their product independently per each farm because at this point we don't have a third party grading system and we don't want to like i think it's and if it's not selling at that price point then maybe we do need to bring it like if for some reason you have a $500 pound, I have maybe I need to look at my stuff too. Not that we've, we sold like 10 pounds. So it doesn't, it's not going to be a lot of data to look at, but if I, if there's a strain that I have on the menu at 500 and I haven't sold any of that the whole time at 500, then maybe I should take it myself down to the 400 level. And we could, we could do that. Just put it where we think it's going to sell. And if it doesn't work, we could always move it or change it later, but we should have our own products graded on the menu. I think that would be fair and we could try it. My a follow up question I have would be regarding our own personal page. Um, if we are to have that, then um, and I don't think that's really attached to SOFF, is it? If, if I have my own 
separate page. So I don't know everything about it, but from what I understand is you'll have like your own page and your own menu. And then I could add like under, we, we can under soft's page, we can add it, like add you on there as one of our brands that we have. And then you could probably put some, some stuff on our menu also. Okay. Cause I guess my, what I was thinking is like maybe the reverse of what I had mentioned before, where I could put my best stuff on the SOFF page adhering to the $500 a pound mark that you guys have and that you like, um, which I don't disagree with that. Uh, but then maybe on my own personal page, that's where I would maintain my things that I don't think are going to sell quickly at 500 and, and, you know, just let them rip at whatever price I set for my own. And they also have that cool, manual. like promo code thing that you could use too, where you can say the price is like 500, but you can do like a promotional monthly discount. So it's not like permanently lowering it. You say, okay, everything at Green Bandit yeah. is 25% off this month. And that way you can like, because of the solstice or whatever you feel like it so that it's like, it makes it look like you're just lowering it for like a fun reason instead of out of desperation. Yeah. And which I'm just like, I'm at the same point as like, uh, things are getting way tighter. Like I couldn't even have foreseen it getting as bad as it is right now. Like I was pretty optimistic, honestly, like it's going to be fine. Like they're going to want it. Like it's always, they, August, they always come and buy it. And I'm doing really crappy right now. Like I'm broke and nothing like sales are not coming in anywhere. And I'm also need my barn for drying. So I'm going to try to sell through whoever as cheap as I can, but I'm going to keep our menu. I don't want to like undercut our menu too. Like if people are buying from us and then they can go get it at Portland cannabis market for cheaper, that's not good relationships either too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know what, the, I don't know what the right answer is like at all. So. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking like, I, I was actually thinking that maybe we could have, um, well, like a schedule, would be good. And then depending on the different qualities, they would kind of land in the various schedule, like the various price. And I think that's kind of what you guys have been doing. Um, but then also maybe what we could do is like have, have like a percent decrease and increase month to month or quarter to quarter, something like that to reflect kind of like um, the co-ops, but do it all very, organized organized and together you know to so like if if like right now harvest is coming up we have a bunch of product we need to move quickly then maybe the co-op all together lower low, lowers its price so instead of 100 we go down but we reduce the price at a certain percentage and then we increase the price after a certain period of time so like for the first six months we do it at this price the second six months we do it at this price like it's a different um, percentage so then that way like also there's like this pressure to move like for the dispensaries and other buyers to like get in while the price is a certain point knowing that it's going to go up you know, something like that i don't know just a thought i wanted to give i wanted to take uh uh i'm gonna i have another appointment at five but i'm gonna leave this on like so you guys can keep talking um, but I'll probably end up stopping the video. And so I want to make sure that we give um, uh, Robert Duran with right, owner of Right Kind the opportunity to introduce himself. Robert, are you, do you happen to be there? <laughs> You're muting and unmuting. Are you available, Robert? Can you guys hear me? I'm kind of in a bad service spot. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah we can. I hear you. I hear you now. Yeah, I'm in a bad service spot, so I won't be able to talk that much. I was well, just kind it, of poking in go. to see what this was all about. Well, yeah, give, give it a go. Introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Robert with Right Kind. I uh, just started kind of hearing what you guys are saying and. It's kind of depressing, honestly. 
Are you guys talking about last year's product going for 500 or fresh new stuff? Last year's. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just bringing stuff off the lines and we're going to be trimming here real soon, but I don't have any of last year's product. 500 actually isn't that bad. I'm hearing a lot of people at 300 for last year's. We've been at three, 350, 400 for most of the year. Yeah, yeah that's kind of what I'm hearing as well, which makes it really hard to continue to operate, in my opinion. But it's too tight. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, I can't make any mistakes, basically. Something like that. Um, yeah, so. Oh, oh go ahead. <laughs> Robert, you've been out to my farm, haven't you? You're growing in Gold Hill? Yeah, I got one of Sean's acres. Yeah, and I'm there. Nice to talk to you again. It's been a <laughs> while. Yo, how's it going? Oh, trying to survive over here. Yeah, it's definitely making me want to, I don't know, think about different opportunities. <laughs> But I have a really good product right now coming off the line. So it was, I guess we'll see how it goes. Last year I was able to sell everything, but it was a struggle. I heard your product's awesome. And the last time I talked to anybody about. Five to 600. Better than what we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Last year I got seven, but I had to sell it all really fast, you know before it got ugly. <laughs> yeah, things are, things are tight right now. It's a weird, weird, weird season. I think like I had kind of touched base before everybody got on about, I spoke to somebody today and they're saying basically like out of the 400 producers that they contacted in the last two weeks, 30% of those are going out of business. They're not growing anymore. Yeah. Which and makes so, you think that maybe in the future it could be worth something, but I'm just, I'm trying I, to decide myself. I think that's what's really, really driving our prices down is people like me actually right now, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to, I'm going to have to take whatever I can so I could harvest and stay like live to fight another day kind of situation. But I'm hoping that if we can keep pulling together, like, and at least work on marketing and let people know who we are and that we're here and that we're like why they should buy sun grown product um, that we might have a chance next year. Cause all the, all the flour is going to go bye-bye and there's no oil market anymore for people like us that aren't like their people aren't going to buy our oil. We can't make any profit off of oil material anymore for like at least a little while. Cause there's just so much of it being produced. And a lot of the producers that are going to stay around are planning on just going to oil so if we can work on getting our name out there and even if we just surviving this year and being cautious, like me, I was not smart. I trimmed up every single pound of weed I had and I used all of my money to that I did have to do that. So now I'm in a point where um, I got to do whatever I can. But if, I think things are going to be better next year is what all that was going for. Yeah, I mean, that many people going out certainly drives prices way down right now because a lot of people are looking at it like it's just recovering right whatever expenses they possibly can no doubt that's um hurting because i know a lot of um we've spoken to a number of wholesalers and dispensaries that have bought from farms that are going out of business they know that's what you know that was the story told to them and it was like well this is why 250 a pound or whatever and so yeah that that hurts there there won't be that massive swath of people going out of business next year because they've already gone so i think that it is true that you know we we do stand to have a potentially better year next year although i think it's still going to maintain pretty challenging you know price points and things like that um and yeah so you know for us we we can make it work at 400 bucks a pound I mean, I can, we can turn a profit, pay, pay the bills, pay people and keep going. That's how we survived in our first year in business back in 2017. And by the time everything was sold, um, 
you know, we did have enough money to carry over and do it again the following year. It's not how I would want to live always, you know, it's, it's tighter than we would like, but you know, that's kind of where I'm at. Been there since early this year, Sarah and I accepted the fact that if we could average out 400 bucks a pound, we'd actually be pretty darn happy. Um, we're more like averaging out. <coughs> yeah 375 maybe by the time it's all said and done this year because we've had to sell a lot for 350 sometimes a wholesaler will make a deal at 300 oh, by no accidents reason. yeah well anyway but still <laughs> you know it's uh so it's it's brutal out there um but yeah i mean it i so that's that's kind of where i'm at is i'm like hey you know what what do we got to do to see it go um, even if it's not at a much of a profitable point for, for us, the, the calculus is most certainly to just bring in the money that it takes to harvest and, um, and, you know, pay the bills, even if we're just flat, you know, if we break even, let's say, I mean, it still pushes us down the road to a better time, hopefully. But that's kind of where we stand, you know, we're not looking at it like, um, it's, there's no plan. There's no plan for the profit that we're going to make. You know, it's it, the plan is to just pay the bills and keep going. So, um, th thoughts that I have, I have just in, in terms of, yeah, it's about survival and like kind of in response to, you know, some of these bigger players. We were kind of talking about some bigger players earlier and, uh, just kind of like what's happening, like economies of scale, uh, the ability to invest and hold, and essentially that's that's what a lot of companies are doing. These outside investors are doing. A lot of people who have the resources are out of a kind of a, a place where they're like in a position to hold, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about selling three seventy at three seventy five, three hundred seventy five, so that we can hold essentially and survive via another season. Um, and what we have to do is make sure what we're, we don't continue to uh, participate in the kind of a downward spiral where other companies are kind of doing that and then essentially going out of business or there are bigger companies that have that economy scale that are being able to sell at a much lower price. Um, and their, so their whole position is a lot lower than what ours is. But one thing that I, I have learned from talking to a lot of people in this industry over the years, that the more successful you are as a farm or company or a dispensary, if you could, the higher you are in terms of the percentage, like where you're at, like with gross revenue and whatnot, um, like for example, if you're a dispensary that is in the top 10% of sellers, or you're an extraction company that's in the top 10%. If you can get into the top 10%, then there it's a lot easier to like stay profitable and be profitable and make money and actually be able to then um, invest in other areas of of uh, your you know your company. I mean, we we've seen that we've seen that with other companies where they were dispensaries and now they're growers, or they're wholesalers and now they're growers, or they're growers and now they're dispensaries. They're able to uh, expand and be vertically integrated and those kinds of things. So the point that I'm trying to say is that we really do have to put a lot of energy and a lot of faith in this organization to become like Oregon's number one outdoor wholesale, you know, or wholesaler of outdoor high quality cannabis. That's really what Southern Oregon Family has, Farms has to do assuming interstate commerce doesn't happen happen anytime soon it, we will need to do that because otherwise there's no way for us to compete i don't believe that people are going to be able to compete long um by themselves you know what i mean and so once we once we have a position where we're we're like in the top like in the top tier of uh branding organizations then I think it just gets easier from there but it's going to require a lot of work to get there yeah um, yeah so in in our experience I would say that um, 
<clears throat> when it comes to pricing with, with weed. Um, I haven't felt like over the years we've been relegated to the price that we set. I feel like we've been kind of relegated to the price that is industry standard kind of going around. And so, you know, there have been years where, you know, maybe in the beginning of the year we were selling for 550 a pound and, and moving through quite a bit of weight like that. And then as prices and back in those times prices were taking up as we went into summer and our prices ticked up with that and so we wound up you know sarah and i've seen years where in the same year we might have sold a pound for 400 bucks and then later in that same year we sold a pound for seven or eight hundred bucks so i don't i've never felt like just because somebody got a good price on green bandit that now green bandit stuck at that price i think that what I've seen is that the industry does this to us. I mean, there, there are like a thousand producers out there, whatever. And so irrespective of what we do with price, the state and the major purchasing price points are going to be set by like the collective of all of us, you know? So I'm just saying that I, I don't feel like if we do, if we do decide that we got to do something to make fire sale happen, I don't think we're stuck there. I just think that, and again, I think we're all better for it. The further we make it down the road, I do think we're better for it. So, you know, that's that's also part of it for me. Like I look at this and say, I don't have to always be making the profit that I see in my mind as what's fair and appropriate. You know, uh, yeah. Just it, so it sounds, if I might like do like a recap thing, um, it sounds like most of us or all of us are like open to adjusting prices on the leaf link page based off of um, just what helps move product more, but is still within a range that is profitable and fair to us. But that as long as we are openly communicating about it and it's like, Hey guys and gals, <laughs> you know, this, you know, this, bud, this product of, of ours, um, we feel like would be better at 400, 450, whatnot you know even if it's like the promo code or what whatever is and then we're all like okay sounds good so that we're not undercutting each other on the soft page sounds like that that's where I think what at. i've been seeing a lot of is people as the price comes down they've been changing their pounds which is really hard you know to judge whose pounds are what i'm talking like when people are throwing b buds in their a buds and now they're selling it for 400 oh. and those, you oh, wow. know so people are doing that is where I see the price get stacked down. And then, you know, and then there's the sense of desperation from a lot of people. And that's where they just end up selling for real low. Somehow we got to educate people on what a good pound is and what isn't, you know, yeah, that's what I see a lot of right now is shake and bee buds and they're $350 pounds. Yeah. And trying to call that their, their a flower. Yeah. And they just call it like a pound, you know, like that's kind of what's happening nowadays. Yeah, I did yeah, not even yeah. hear that or think of that. It's just, just like integrity is, you yeah. know, it's becoming yeah. more rare. But then it drives the price down of the good product, you know, because yeah. we all get desperate and we end up trying to sell it for whatever it sells for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's what I see people doing. And it's really hurting the market even more because they're able to sell it at that cheaper price and not care so much. Mm -hmm. But in our yeah, case, we, we, we've only that. like continued to we like sort out more bee bud now than we ever did before. We're trimming it more cleanly than ever before. We're putting in, we're actually putting in more labor and effort to less product because all of it matters so much now. So even at our, even at that price, uh, we're not, we don't see it flying off the shelves and there's certainly no complaints about, I mean, I have like a, a minus bud coming off of my main pounds. You know, it's like a plus is the only bud that we're hand trimming be, simply because it's competitive in every direction. Yeah. And I feel like we be, because we've been more, uh, we've, we've done that more this year than in previous years. It's like to be competitive. And I mean, we certainly get the reaction from, managers of like whoa this does look really good this is trimmed really well this is you know it's like i feel like it's helped it certainly helped with um maintaining business but for sure people are stoked yeah. on the pounds and i've not had one complaint this year about like um 
either small buds or not trimmed enough. It's It's been totally like people are stoked, but they also think that they're like, they think that they're buying weed from us at a price that's like good for us too. So it, it all seems like a win-win when it's really, it's kind of a, just a win on one side, <laughs> you know. It, um, it costs me $380 to produce a pound of weed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as cheap as people tend to think that it is and uh, not as lucrative when they're, when you're selling pounds for 400 and things like that, 500 bucks even. Um, Did Aaron want to say something? Oh yeah. I don't know. Oh. Um, so uh, yeah, just. Um, what I want to, I've only got a few minutes before I have to jump off and again, you guys can continue, but um I kind of wanted to talk to, I mean, again, why that, that just, uh, uh, contributes to the point of the co-op. We have to educate. It sounds like we have to educate the clients. We have to like really our, 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 uh, our customers, we have to like foster these win-win relationships. We have to like sell, so, Southern and family farms to the dispensaries in not just by getting good, like high quality cannabis, but also supporting the industry. And I think there's a lot of people like Christine, you were saying that there are people who are interested in where their product is coming from and they're concerned about them. And that's why the co-op is going to actually be successful because people are going to be, because that is part of the Southern and family farms brand. We just have to, do the like pull the trigger and get organized and do an effort for education. Yeah, we do, we do. So my so what I wanted to do, the first thing I wanted to talk about, and it and we touched on this a couple of weeks ago, is kind of what is our marketing campaign strategy in terms of like when we talk to a retailer, are we gonna be able to have a can we convince them to give us a place on their shelf? their shelving. And we talked in depth about that. We we're talking about like, hey, let's have a let's have a um a humidor or something like that. Like what did you call it? Uh, let's let's provide that. Let's provide yeah. shelf like a like a display for them. Let's provide that. And yeah, it's gonna be more expensive than everybody else's. It's gonna be more expensive than the hundred dollar a pound B bud that somebody got or the even the $350 a pound uh, product. It's going to be $500 a pound that they're going to pay for, but it's one of a kind. It's the top shelf at the liquor store. When you go to the liquor store, it's the top shelf. Nobody, a lot of people don't go straight for the top shelf, but a lot of people do buy the top shelf. And, and it's priced appropriately. You pay a premium for it. So we got to have to, we have to like separate ourselves from everybody else. And I think we need to also do it in that way. And I tell you what, when we get that, I I've been talking about it. I've got at least 25 clients that are dispensary owners. Some own, you know, one to five plus dispensaries. If I had a presentation, I could, I could start selling this to people. So um, I just sent you an email. I forgot about this. I should have talked about it right away. Gabe sent us a proposal about helping us get organized and kind of move forward with our marketing strategy and it's actually super cool and maybe you can open it and we could look at it and share it together really quick um because Did you want to say something aaron and that while we're opening that sure so thank you um the one point of like information of my point of view to add to what you're going with as far as trying to establish a premium product is um when I what I notice is that we have some decent numbers on sales when with the right stores, we're getting decent numbers with the stores that are also mom and pop original, you know, people that believe in the industry. So I would just articulate how much I feel it's important to find the right fits. And therefore, in those cases, those people want to support us because we're yeah. providing the product that they're looking to associate with. So oftentimes those people are willing to extend more of a helpful hand, such as, Oh, I have a humidor or I have this shelf space. 
And rather than us trying to influence somebody that doesn't want us as much as we want them, they want all the free stuff they can get from us. Yeah, because- there's people, there's all kinds of people like that. And then, but then there's the people who are going to be like, they have to run a, a profitable business, but they're also going to care. They're going to be like, yeah, this isn't ideal. Like, we, we're moving this product, but it's not ideal. We really actually want to move your product. That's that's what I see uh, a lot of, at least the people that I work with, that's the angle they're coming from. They know, they're, they're on board. They recognize the difference between a cooperative of 10 farms versus one giant conglomerate that's, you know, just trying to undercut the market and be a bunch of assholes, you know what I mean? So- no, I yeah, mean, I'm, I'm not anti, I guess too. I'm not anti-capitalism, but they're different than what we're doing. You know, it's different than what we're doing. We just have to get in front of those people. Well, what yep. distinguishes us is we are craft, right? Mm-hmm. Each one of our co-op members is a small farm Yeah. in, in the grand scale, scope of things when comparative to how Buddies operates their farms at 14. So, yeah. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop the video now and, um, and then, but you guys could keep talking. I can hang on for a little bit longer. We can go over that proposal that you were talking about, Christine. Do you want to share your screen?